Mark Bertoloni served as head of Aetna for eight years until 2018 when the company was sold to uh, pharmaceutical giant CVS. Now, under his leadership, Aetna employees received several benefits, including being paid for sleeping, encouraged to practice yoga and mindfulness, and also to get help with paying off student loans and tuition assistance. There was a lot, along with receiving pay well above federal minimum wage. Bertoloni is out with a new memoir, Mission Driven Leadership, My Journey as a Radical Capitalist. Mark, welcome to the show. And we also have Julia LaRoche with us. Uh, a lot of questions to ask you, but right now it would seem the term capitalism gets tarnished by some in politics. But you describe yourself as a radical capitalist. Right. Uh, what does that mean? Well, I think what's happened <clears throat> um, with business education and business in general is that for a lot of years we were trained as business people to steward scarce resources and to put at risk plentiful resources. And for a long time, the scarce resources were capital and the plentiful resources were people because we had assembly lines and piecework and all these other sorts of things. That is completely flipped now. And so we now have plentiful financial resources. You can just see it in the markets with the rates the way they are, the flat yield curve, low inflation, yet we have a very big scarcity in people. And as you look at elementary and grade school education, the kids coming through school aren't getting the skills they need to compete in a future economy. So we should be willing to make those investments in people, much like we make the investments in machines. However, we treat machines from a tax and accounting standpoint better than we treat people. Uh, so an investment in a person gets expensed immediately where an investment in a machine can be depreciated over time when you get the benefits. And so this idea of reversing the model and spending more on people, investing in them for the long run, was the idea that we went forward with back in 2015. You know, oftentimes CEOs face this short-term pressure. Mm -hmm. They have to give out guidance. Uh, what are they doing in terms of buybacks? How, from your experience as a CEO, does someone balance that, the short-term, with the long-term? You get the shareholders you deserve. So unless you have a compelling story and you manage that share base by saying, here's what I'm going to do with our resources. And we had a, our largest shareholder when I took over as CEO, when the dividend doubled and share buybacks increased. I said, well, actually, we've cut the share buybacks in half and we're not touching the dividend. And this person said to me, well, what if your largest shareholder demands that you do that? So then my largest shareholder should get out of my stock. And they did it $39. So I think you can manage the shareholder base. You can talk to people about what the strategy is. And when we announced raising minimum wage from 12 to $16 an hour, eliminating out-of-pocket costs for our employees in January of 2015, I was at the JP Morgan conference in San Francisco, and we had 200 million out of our 350 million shares there, and not one of them, mm -hmm. not one of them asked me a question about why they got it. So Aetna, of course, agreed to sell to CVS mm -hmm. last year. Um, are you confident that CVS is going to keep some of these same values? And more broadly, do you think, how many other CEOs do you think are, are coming around to this way of thinking? Well, I think you saw yesterday comments by Jamie Dimon, um, you know, about, you know, this income inequality that we have in our nation, the people being left behind is a huge problem um, that is not only has emerged, but will emerge as a bigger and bigger problem going forward. And unless we find different ways to use our resources as businesses, instead of waiting for government to fix it. Um, with Dave Cody and, 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 um, and, and the group at um, Citizens for a Responsible um, Budget, um, I helped start Fix the Debt back in 2012. And that was a waste of time, waiting for the government to do it so we can do it. So I would argue business should step forward. Right now, interestingly enough, in the polling, business has more credibility than almost any other institution in the country. Can, can I ask you along those lines, because the headline yesterday was that CEOs, or, you know, the top CEO pay was a million dollars a month. I mean, Mr. Iger at Disney got 66 million right. uh, in stock and benefits. I don't, I don't think Wall Street's hearing what you're hearing, or at least business is hearing what you're saying. What am I missing here? Because it seems the inequality, Jamie Dimon, he might talk about it, but right. I don't see action being taken to change it. Well, I think it's what you do with the resources of your organization to make it happen. So we have engaged our employees, um, we have engaged um, um, our communities um, as a business. I think Jamie's doing the same thing as investment in Detroit, as investment in communities. So through the company we can do a lot of things and personally we can do a lot of things. Um, so the vast majority of the proceeds that I put, I got out of the CBS deal went into a foundation called Anahata.org. And Anahata is focused on environment, 
education and community sustainability. Because I just don't think that our governments are suited to manage the kind of ecosystems we've created, both in social media and economically. And they try to get bigger to manage it. And the only way to solve it, well, there are two ways. We can create a new world order, or we can go back to community and manage at the community level. And I think you have to get back to community and you have to make investments in the community. We have to ask you about healthcare. You had two life-changing moments that really changed the way you think about healthcare. Now that you're no longer CEO of Aetna, mm -hmm. when you look out, um, what do you think needs to change? And, and given your own experience, what would right. you like to see changed? 60% of one's life expectancy is determined by where they live. 10% is based on the clinical services they got, and 30% is based on the genetic code. So your zip code matters more than your genetic code. And yet our investment in social determinants is smaller than any other OECD nation. So when you add up all the OECD nations around the world, we are now 12th when you combine social and health spending. We are the only nation that spends more than 40% on healthcare. We spend 62. And so our social programs are letting us down. They're showing up in the healthcare system as higher costs. The opioid crisis, which now kills more people than automobile accidents, AIDS, suicide, and gunshot wounds put together, 2,900 deaths in, 19, in 2000, now 70,000 deaths is a loss of hope by the American public in the f their futures. 30% of families believe their kids will do better versus 70% back in the 70s. And so we have this loss of hope, this loss of dynamism, this sort of clan lock in communities where we live, where we're not reskilling, we're not relearning. And so healthcare is key to that. The opposite of health is poverty. And when you don't have health, you can't reskill, you can't learn, you can't grow. You can't take care of your families. And so we have to get back at that level and provide more services in the home and in the community and keep people out of the institutional medical industrial complex. But to your point, should that come from government or should that come from nonprofits and the, and the private and the sector? market, yeah. I would argue till the, till the cows come home that even if we could do a fair income redistribution model at the government, federal government level, they can't get out of their own way to make decisions on how to spend it effectively. And so we have to do it at the community level. We have to get back to the local level and do it. And, and, and I think that's gonna be the most powerful process we're gonna have going forward. You're gonna join forces, the Democrats are making big news about Medicare for all and healthcare. Yeah. Republicans probably going towards 2020 will have some kind of plan. Are you gonna side with either of them? Uh, let me put it this way. When, I, when, when, when people say, let's talk about single payer or Medicare for all, I say, okay, tell me what that is. And nobody can tell me what it is because it's just a populist phrase. And then when I say, okay, show me a country that has it, they say UK or Canada. Those aren't single payer. Those are socialized medicine. The providers and the financing is paid for by the government. We have one of those in the United States. It's called the veterans system, the VA. And how is that working? Yeah. And so I would argue we, have, if we can't just fix the financing when the investment is bad where we're spending it, how we're spending it. It's a warranty system today. Mm -hmm. You get a warranty card when you join a health plan. If you get broken, present yourself to the nearest dealer and we'll fix you at some cost. It's not free. And so we have to change that model to what are we doing in the community? This is why we did the CVS deal. We gotta do something in the community where we can get people into the, into the stores or have the stores reach out to the community as a way of finding better ways to take care of people, keeping them away from the system. You just mentioned the CVS deal and we know the CVSs are within many, many Americans who are super yep. close to that. Another uh, healthcare venture is Warren Buffett teaming up with Jeff Bezos and Jamie mm -hmm. Dimon to form a new initiative called Haven. What are your thoughts on that? I would spend more time watching what Jeff Bezos is doing. I mean, his move to do HSAs and FSAs through the, um, web, through, the, through the cloud on his site is a bigger deal than anything Haven's done. His idea to go buy Pillback is not about buying drugs. It's about getting into the home. And if we can do more in the home around providing services, nutrition, I would, I can prove it economically. You can take care of people's transportation, food, fuel and socialization in the home, particularly seniors, for cheaper than it is for one or two ER visits. And so why wait for people to show up in the system? 
want to hear more from you. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Yep. But I'm, I'm looking Come forward to Julie. Again. Yeah, <laughs> Joy and Julie's going to do more with you. But uh, Mark Bertolini, the book is Mission Driven Leadership, My Journey as a Radical Capitalist. You're always welcome here. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you.